Hi guys, can I get a sound check? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. All right. How's everybody doing? We're good, Professor. That's good to hear. Every once in a while, I like freak out. I need like a reset or something. It's getting gets to to be too much. I don't know if you guys are like that or not, but. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. The fires are closing in on my house, man. They're coming. All right. That's, what area that's, is that? Um, I am just northwest of Pasadena. Um, really close to JPL, if you guys know. Like, I can walk to JPL. Um, so it's a like it's a neighborhood called like not La Canada, right by the mountains. It's still pretty far, but you know it's just you know you, you just like can't help but track in that thing. And it's like every time I look at it, it's like closer and closer. But anywho, I guess it's all part of the fun. If I get burned out, I'll just go buy a van and live in it or something. Um, let's see what happened. Oh. Wait. Um, am I in the right? Nope. Sorry, just good guys. Give me one second here. I think I went into the wrong meeting. Mm. Yeah. And then. And I want to screen. All right. Okay. Good. So, um, so guys, I, um, you know, last time, last lecture, we started talking about the, you know, the actual characteristics of a um, of a MOS transistor, and um, I think I did such a bad job of it that like looking at it, I don't know what was wrong with me, but I I didn't I didn't feel like I was making any sense. So I thought I would take it one more time from the top and tell it to you guys the same info but just in a different way and see if it hopefully it'll make more sense or maybe it'll just keep confusing you or maybe the first time made sense. I don't know, but, but I just want to take it from the top. These are like important concepts and unfortunately, you know, we don't have a lot of time to cover it. So if you don't have background, a background in MOS transistors, I think it could get really confusing. So again, I'm just going to go do it again in a, you know, same information, but hopefully in a more measured way. Okay, so let's let's start it from the top. Is that um, you know? Let's say you want to make a MOS transistor. What do you do? Well, you have you know you're using a you're doing a you know you have a semiconductor which use silicon for, and again I'm I'm gonna take it right really from the top, but just do a um, a real short version of this. So if you look at the periodic table, you have, what do you got? You got sort of this group four. You have carbon, you have silicon, you have germanium. These are in this group four. In this group four, what it means is there are four valence electrons for each for each atom. And the valence electrons are the electrons on the, the very top outside shell of electrons that are basically bonding to adjacent atoms, okay? So that's our group four. This is group four, and these are, you know, the popular semiconductors. 
Um, silicon is in, well, sort of like let's, things started with germanium back in the day. The very first transistors were ma made from germanium. And um, it's still used a little bit, but it's all about silicon. And, you know, all the chips, everything is pretty much all silicon. And then carbon, you know, we took on like silicon carbide and these things you hear about. But anyway, like basically group four and basically silicon. Okay. Then looking at the adjacent columns, group three and group five. In group three, we have um, boron and a few other things. But boron is popular in the... That's what primarily thing we use as an additive to silicon to make it more useful. And in group five, we have phosphorus. Um, which is P and arsenic, which are also popular additives. Okay, so what happens again is if you just had a silicon crystal, you would have a bunch of silicon atoms sitting next to each other, and each silicon atom would be surrounded by um, four other silicon atoms. And then because you have each one of them has four valence electrons, they would completely couple with each other in the sense that um, all the valence electrons would get taken and you wouldn't have any at, at low temperature, at low temp you wouldn't have any mobile carriers. You wouldn't have any extra electrons or any holes flying around. Holes are lack of an electron, okay? So you can think of it just in a, just in a crystalline lattice, a hole is a lack of an electron and you can just think of it as a positively mobile particle. It's really, it's not an actual particle, it's just a lack of a electron moving around, okay? So then what you can do is to create a P-type material, what you can do is you can, instead of, you know, remove some of these silicons and by using uh, something like an ion implanter or otherwise diffusing stuff, basically stick a boron atom here. in your silicon. And then, so what happens is because boron only has three valence electrons, you end up with one of these bonds, one of these silicon bonds end up being, you know, so you get a sort of a missing bond and that is sort of looks like a positively charged particle and uh, instead of calling, you know, elect the symbol for electron is E minus and the symbol for this lack of an electron in a crystal lattice is to call it a hole or H plus. So it just looks like a positively charged mobile carrier. Okay, so let's say we want to make our, so that's sort of this background for silicon and how we could try to get a P-type material. So, and by definition, a semiconductor that has an excess of holes is called a P-type material. And in fact, that's what we start with. Let's say I want to make an NMOS transistor so I want a P-type substrate. That means I have doped it with boron. So this is silicon doped. That's doped with boron. And that means I have like all these mobile positive charges floating around here.
Okay. All right. So now let's say I'm going to start building my um, NMOS transistor, but first I'm just going to make it NMOS type capacitor. So what I'll do is I'll deposit a very thin silicon dioxide gate. Um, and what do I mean by thin? Let's say, you know, it might be, uh, you know, it's in the, it's, it might be a hundred atom, like atomic layers. So it's very, very thin. Okay. Because this silicon dioxide is coupling your gate material, which is usually polysilicon. So this silicon dioxide is what's coupling that polysilicon to your substrate. So to get more control over your substrate, which is what gives you sort of a gain of a transistor, you want that oxide to be really, really thin, okay? So anyway, you have a polysilicon, you have the silicon, and then to have a um, I need a contact to my substrate. So given that this is, you know, a, a wafer and I only get contacts at the top, I'll put in a P plus, I'll implant a P plus layer here to basically make electrical contact to my P substrate. Okay, and then to make electrical contact, uh, this is all cross-sectional drawings. I'm gonna put in a so this is an actual contact. We talked about this. And then, um, let's say this is, I'm gonna put a piece of metal here. So the, the lowest metal layer is called metal one. And the same thing is gonna happen here. And I get a, contact here okay, and then I'm going to put the metal one here so let's say I'm going to put a voltage on here whoops I'm gonna put a, let me actually shrink this whole thing so it's a little easier to with. Uh, let's see, resize. Hey, nice. Is everybody following me okay? So far? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, let's say, so I'm gonna put a voltage here. So this is my structure. And I'm gonna connect the voltage here and I'm gonna call this the gate voltage, V sub G. Okay, and I'm gonna hook up an external voltage to this guy. I'm gonna call this V sub for V substrate. Let's call it V source. So I think that's what we're gonna use. No, let's call it substrate. Okay, so here we are as a starting point. What else do I wanna say? Okay, so if, let's start with V sub G, so this is the case, this drawing this is the case when V sub G is equal to zero and V substrate is always equal to zero volts. Okay, so the same voltage, you know, nothing's, nothing's happening on the top of this gate, nothing's happening on this channel, we're, we're good. So just sort of sitting there and then let's, for the sake of discussion, let's say we're going to take the same thing. 
and copy it over. Okay, and then I'm gonna make V sub gate greater than zero. So I'm gonna start increasing this V sub G. Sub V sub, I'm gonna leave it alone. Okay, as I start increasing V sub gate, what happens is I'm gonna start putting positive charges here, right? That's how I get a higher potential on V sub G. I'm gonna put basically sort of pull current out of this, put a pull electrons out of this top plate, okay? Now this looks exactly like a capacitor, right? It looks like a parallel plate capacitor. I have the top plate. And I have the bottom plate is the sub. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm putting positive charges here. Okay, and V sub stays alone. So what happens means that I wanna start pushing, or let's say, let me do it this way. I'm not getting rid of these positive charges. I'm just pushing them away. As I put positive charges on the gate, I'm pushing these away from the gate on the other side, because just charges are gonna, positive charges are gonna repel each other. So I end up with this place here. Let's see what color should I pick. I'm gonna end up with this area that there are no positive charges. Okay. And let's say I keep increasing V sub G. And let's say this V sub G goes higher than a magic num a magic thing called V sub T, which is defined as threshold voltage. Okay, and this V sub T is something that's uh, dependent, so it's proportional or inversely proportional to the thickness of the oxide. So the thinner the oxide, no, I'm sorry, it's proportional to V sub G. So um, it is proportional to the thickness of the oxide. So, you know, it or is dependent on um, the thickness of the oxide, the N sub A is the doping concentration of boron. So it's depend on, on the, the designers who are putting or created this capacitor. But those are the, the dials they have, how thick the oxide can be, this oxide gate, and how much you know, boron they, they put into the channel, okay? So let's say once the V sub um, G goes higher than this number V sub T, okay, now what happens is, um, I would have pushed these bad boys even further away. Okay. And extended this, this region. But what happens is in a, in a region that's depleted of electrons and holes, in a piece of silicon, you're constantly getting electron and hole pairs getting generated, and then they're regenerating. They're, they're, they're just because of thermal energy. You're, you're sort of get releasing electrons, and the, the void where they were released from ends up being a hole, and they're just doing this generation recombination. But at some point, at some voltage V sub T, this gets thick enough that the, there's enough electrons and hole generation that the electrons start getting pulled towards the gate and you get a complete, this, this part, area underneath the gate looks like you 
doped that thing with group five elements. It looks like you doped it with phosphorus and actually have a n-type material there. So you have an excess of electrons here. That's what it looks like. So you kind of created this inversion of your material type. Okay, you went from a P-type material to a something that looks like an intrinsic material because you just pushed all the holes out of it, just looks like silicon there for a while. And then it inverts and looks like just that channel underneath the gate looks like an N-type material, just because there's a bunch of electrons floating around there. Okay, doesn't mean that you actually implanted boron Sorry, it doesn't mean you implanted phosphorus or arsenic in there. It just means that because of the structure of this capacitor and the way you push the holes away and the, the generation recombination charge and pulling the electrons in, by all those factors, you created this channel of electrons right underneath the gate, okay? And you can basically adjust that channel by increasing the gate voltage compared to the substrate voltage. If you increase it, increase it, increase it, you hit it something called the threshold voltage, where you get this inversion, and then you can keep increasing it, okay? Everybody with me so far? Yep. Okay. Uh, professor, just to yeah. clarify, the inversion happens at the threshold voltage? Inversion happens at... Yes, it's, it starts happening. So you, you end up, it's, it's not like a, how should I put it? It's not a completely a, you know, a binary type of thing, but it's such a, it, it, you do end up getting something called a sub threshold current or a sub threshold channel, but it, it's much, much less than once you hit the threshold. So if I was gonna, if I was gonna have a, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, do this slowly, but let's say I have, I created a transistor, which I'm gonna do slowly for you guys, but let's say we had source and drain and gate, okay? So let's say I, through this um, V gate, okay, as a function of I sub D, okay? This model of what we're talking about seems like it's saying at some V sub gate or V sub gate source, V sub T, I end up getting a current. That's what this model says. Whereas in reality, what you have is something like something like that, where you start getting a current at a lower point, and this is kind of the V sub T is really the asymptotic point when you take the your higher higher voltage, higher current values and extrapolate them down to zero current is where you what you get V sub T, but in reality it's a little bit different. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, Professor, thank you. Okay. So it's, it's a little bit of a fiction, but it's, it's pretty good. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about how we need to adjust our models in a couple of lectures to adjust for this. This, this area is called, this is called sub threshold current. And we're gonna, we're gonna look at this as like a second order effect. So everything we're talking about so far in this lecture are first order effects, okay? So it's sort of like the simplest model of the, of the transistor. Okay, so let's now say that, let me find a, let's take this guy.
Okay, so, so far I had a capacitor. Okay, now I'm gonna make it into, a, you know, something called a transistor by adding a, uh, sorry, N plus and N plus. So I still have the structure of this channel with the substrate and all this and the gate, but the difference between a MOS capacitor and a MOS transistor are the source and the drain nodes. Okay, and the nice thing about these nodes is um, a little bit. It gives me another couple of um, things to connect up to. Okay, so I can put up, whoops. So I can drop a contact here, drop a contact here, and also put in a metal one. And then I can put in the um, supply voltages here. And I'm gonna call this V sub S for V source, source voltage. And then I'm gonna call this the V sub D for the drain voltage, okay? So, Substrate stays there, connectivity, gate, source, drain. Okay, so now I have an NMOS transistor. Okay, so why is it a transistor? Well, by adjusting, by adjusting this V sub G, Okay, so I can, let's, let me just draw this. So this is the schematic um, drain source and gate. So I can move this gate um, voltage up and down, okay, with respect to the source and drain. And then I can, basically what I'm doing is by changing this gate voltage, I'm changing this current through the device, which is you know a really nice thing to have. So this is sort of this um, change in, sort of it's a trans resistance. I am changing the resistance between source and drain by changing the gate. So a transistor uh, action. So that's kind of the nice thing. But the only difference between a MOS capacitor and a MOS transistor is just we put the two N pluses for the source and the drain um, that can now be our sort of outputs for, for you know, you can, you guys, I'm, I'm sure you take an analog classes, we can, we can take the inputs and outputs in different ways, but um, let's just think about the input here being the gate voltage and the output being the current across from source to drain, okay, for the sake of or our digital circuits for, for the time being. Um, let's see, what else do I want to say here? Okay, so let, let's take it through the same thing, Ben. Um, when V sub G, okay, so the, these guys, the N plus to the P. So notice this P plus, to a P type material, that's a short, that's a dead short. It's the same type material, there's no built-in potential, there's no inverted diode, right? 
But when you're looking at an N plus to a P substrate, this is away from, away from the gate, away from the channel. This looks like a diode, right? You got N plus to a P. And this also looks like a diode, N plus into a P. Meaning in diodes, as long as the V sub D or V sub S, as long as those voltages are higher than the substrate voltage, as long as they're at ground or higher, you don't get any current flowing from the source or the substrate, sorry, the, from the source or the drain, there's no current flowing there. As long as we keep V sub D and V sub S above ground, okay? So they just look like they're diodes as far as their connection, to their reverse bias diode as far as their connection goes to the substrate. But once you take the gate larger than, so let's say, you, let's say you have V sub S at zero, right? So if you keep V sub S is equal to zero. So once V sub gate goes more than the threshold, the substrate is at still at zero, right? Once that happens, I will create my channel of electrons here and I connect the drain to the source. Okay, so now I can get current flowing between the drain and the source. And the higher I make my gate voltage, the more current will flow, okay, for a given drain source voltage, okay, because I'll just, I'm just putting more electrons, I'm creating more electrons in that channel, so I'm increasing the current between drain and source as I increase the gate. Once I get past, once I create this inverted channel, okay? Everybody with me so far? Okay, so, and then what we, what happens is, um, as, just, just to do a few more cases. So you have the case when, um, where do I wanna go with this? No, let's leave it, leave it here for now and then I'll, then I'll sort of compile these various things. So let's just, let's just leave it now that you have this drain, you have this source voltage and you have a gate, you've inverted, you've inverted the channel, and now what we wanna do is we wanna figure out how, how much current do we have going here as a function of these voltages. Okay, so that's what we wanna derive. Okay, so um, the current is really a function it, it's a change in current is a change in charge with respect to time, okay? So that's the very definition of a current. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate how much charge we have in this channel for, you know, as a function of, so first is to calculate, calculate channel charge, charge, as a function of V sub G, V sub S, V sub D, V sub sub, whatever it is, right? T ox, as a function of all this stuff that we have. Then see how fast, how fast do these charges go from drain, from source to drain, sorry. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay guys, so first look, let's look at the charge, charge Q. Okay, so Q is, this is just a straight out of Maxwell's equation, Q is equal to CV, right? 
So we said the structure of a MOS gate. So first let's look at the C, right? The capacitance. It's, we said it's like a parallel plate capacitor with the top of the plate being separate from the bottom of the plate by the oxide thickness. Okay. And the area of this parallel plate capacitor is the length of the transistor times the width of the transistor that we drew. Okay. So, and then, so this, this, this equation ends up being um, the width times the length of the device. Okay. Times the dielectric constant of silicon that's made out of silicon dioxide. Um, so, um, and that's times a silicon dioxide over the thickness of the oxide. So that's this capacitance. Okay, so let's, let's look at that a little bit. So um, WL thickness of the oxide, I'm gonna leave that alone. This epsilon silicon dioxide is 3.9, that's sort of the relative dielectric constant of silicon dioxide times the permittivity of free space. I think that's 8.854 times 10 to the minus 14 farads per centimeter. Okay, so this, this guy here is a universal constant. Okay, this guy here is a constant for silicon dioxide. When the device engineers built this process for, for us to design a transistor in, they decided TOX. They built the TOX as a designer you do not have any control over it. So to make life for us easy, we're gonna call all this stuff. So we're gonna call, um, uh, we're gonna just create a new thing called C ox, epsilon ox, silicon dioxide. Sorry, let me just keep my terms the same. Epsilon silicon dioxide, which is this good stuff here divided by Tox. This stuff is constant, we can't change it. So we're gonna just call it Cox. And then that basically makes the C of the gate equal to WL times Cox. Okay, and I have the, the parts I do have control over is W times L. Okay. So that's this part. The other part is V, okay? So this is the voltage on the channel, right? Now, the thing is, unless the, 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 the top of the channel, the gate is constant across the channel, but unless the drain and source voltages are exactly the same, the voltage of the channel is gonna depend on where you are. Uh, wasn't that very good for me? So it depends on where you are here, where you are here. The source, so um, the source is defined because it's a completely symmetric structure. Notice the source and drain look completely symmetric around the gate. The source is defined as a voltage that's low, between the source and the drain, whichever one is the lower voltage is called the source, and the higher one is called the drain. So the highest voltage difference between gate and channel happens right around here close to the source, okay? Because that's the lowest of the source and the drain. And the lowest voltage difference between gate and the channel happens here right by the drain. Okay, you have this sort of continuity of voltages in the channel, the drain being 
um, the gate drain being the lowest voltage and the gate source being the highest voltage, okay? So to get, and what we do is to get this charge, we pick an average value for the voltage in the channel. So we say, okay, so this average value, average channel value is um, V, um, V source plus V drain over two. Okay, it's just the average we're, we're picking. Okay. And I'm gonna just rewrite this as V source plus V drain source over two. And V drain source is just equal to V drain minus the V source. So I just rewrote this, just rewrote it, okay? And remember the, 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 the voltage of that you'll see across, you first have to put enough voltage on the gate to invert the channel, okay? So we, we have to first put in a V sub T or the threshold voltage up until that point, nothing happens, right? So first we have to put V sub T and after we get V sub T, the incremental voltage after V sub T on the gate is what adds to the incremental charge in the channel. So what we really need to look at is VGC, V gate channel minus V sub T, okay, to, for this voltage. So this is equal to V gate channel minus V sub T, the voltage part. Okay, so that is equal to um, V gate minus, so we're going to use this average value of the channel voltage, which I wrote as this guy, minus V source plus V drain source over two, minus this whole thing, minus a VT. And that ends up being R, move this stuff around. That ends up being our complete equation. So if this is our V, um, this V is equal to this. Okay, and the CG is equal to that. And that's our Q. So I'm, let me just rewrite it. Um, Q is WL C ox. Again, that's our C times V sub G minus um, V sub S plus V drain source over two minus V sub D. Okay, so that's our charge. Okay, so that's our, where were we? That's our charge here. And now we wanna see this, what is our, how fast are these things moving? Okay, so what's the time? Okay, so uh, the time that the charges move in are, you know, if you look at the velocity, is distance over time. Okay, so if I wanna get the time, I look at velocity of those charges over the distance they have to travel. Um, last time we said the velocity of an electron in, in silicon or semiconductor is a function of the electric field 
okay? And the, um, the proportionality constant is this thing called mobility. Sorry, guys. My handwriting is degenerating here. Mobility. So again, given we're at a certain temperature, a certain doping concentration, the fact that you're silicon, et cetera, this ends up being some constant. It's not a universal constant, mind you, but for that NMOS transistor in that particular process, at that particular temperature, it's a constant. Okay, so that tells you how fast, if you have a certain electric field between drain and source, how fast those electrons are moving. Okay, and the distance is the distance from source to drain, and that's the channel length. Okay, so basically T is mu e over L, which is the length of the the length of the device. Okay, further we said electric field is just the voltage, the drain source voltage over the length. Okay, and that's also a definition. <coughs> Excuse me. By the way, are you guys able to follow this a little bit better than my what I was saying last time? Hopefully the two of them anyway will make sense together. But um, I'm just now, I'm just driving, deriving the drain current equation as a function of these voltages. Okay, so I'm gonna plug in that for electric field. So mu VDS over L squared. I just plugged this guy into here. Into here and got this for the time. Okay, so now going back, I sub D is so this charge that we calculated over the time. So let's plug everything in. Sorry guys, just trying to make it a little cleaner here. So that's the charge. And then divided by this T, which is this guy. Wait, I, why did I do this? Hold on a second, guys, sorry. So, distance is velocity times time. Yeah, I screwed up here, guys. So time is distance over velocity. Um, so let me take this. So it's distance over velocity. So it's L over, so it's L over mu E. Whoops. So it is L squared over L squared over mu VDS. Yeah. 
So it's actually this L squared over mu BDS. All right, so then I'm gonna just start multiplying and dividing. So this L squared goes with this L. Um, I'm gonna move, move stuff around. I'm gonna get mu C ox. Um, w, whoops, W over L. Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this um, v gate v gate t. Tim, you might need to put yourself on mute. There you go. Thanks. Um, v t. -T. Sorry, no, I screwed up here. Sorry, guys. Got distracted. Okay, I'm gonna call. Uh, let me move stuff around here before I. I'm, I'm taking too many shortcuts again. Um, so I'm gonna move some of this stuff around. I'm gonna call. Um, so I'm gonna call this VGS. So VGS. So I'm gonna put this combination here, and I'm gonna move the T over minus VT. I'm gonna call this VGT plus VDS over two. Did I get everything? Times VDS, this guy comes up, okay? So let me just go one more, mu C ox W over L VGT plus Oh, sorry guys, this should be, because this minus went in here, it's also gotta go over here. So this is a minus. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just doing math at this point. So, okay, so basically we end up with this. Okay, and, and we called VGT. We define that as gate source voltage minus the threshold. Okay, and then the book. So now we have um, I sub D, the, the drain source current, as a, a function of, so these are process constants, the mobility, and remember C ox was dependent on the thickness of the oxide and the dielectric constant of silicon dioxide. So it's a function of these constants. And then a function of um, how we drew the transistor, which is this W and L, and also how we, we the voltages that we apply across the transistor, which are the gate, the source, the drain voltages. Okay, so now we have I sub D. Um, so furthermore, to make our life a little simpler, um, for any particular transistor, we're gonna, let's say you've drawn this transistor, okay? It's, it's done and dusted, it's in silicon. This guy, you can just assume to be the gain of the transistor or beta. So we can define beta as mu C ox, W over L to make I sub D is equal to beta times VGT minus VDS over to VDS. Okay. So here we are. This is like the, the master, the master equation for this, for the time being. Okay, now there are, let's look at the, the particulars, okay? So now if you look at a, a transistor and look at the I sub D in various states. So the first place, so we have 
the V sub gate, V sub drain, V sub source, whoops. And, boy, sorry guys, V sub. Okay, those are the four voltages we have. Okay, and so let's see how this transistor looks with different values for these in different operating regions, okay? So V sub, we always make it zero for an NMOS transistor. Okay, and then we'll talk about how PMOS is different. Is everybody followed me so far? Again, I just talked about how we created the transistor, how we created the channel by changing the voltage with respect to the, uh, the channel um, potential, and then sort of what the current looks like. Okay, so then we have a bunch of regions of operation. Again, always with this I sub D current. When V sub G, let's say, so these are the different I sub Ds. Okay, so it's equal to zero. If, if the gate voltage, if the gate source voltage is less than the threshold voltage, means that we have not inverted the transistor. Okay, so there's no channel. So we get no current in that case. Everybody's, everybody's clear with that, so no channel. So no current and the name for this thing is cut off. The transistor is cut off. The source is cut off from the drain. Okay, so it's off. Second case is when the gate source voltage is larger than V sub T. So now we've inverted the channel, the transistor is on, but the drain source voltage is less than or equal to V gate source voltage minus the threshold voltage. Okay, what, is, what does that mean? Okay, notice that um, the gate, how should I put this? So, the gate voltage, or should I say the gate source voltage minus a VT, the V gate minus a VT is the minimum voltage that you need to turn, to create a channel, right? So if you're at right, if you're right at the source, so if you are, right at this point okay you are your v gate source minus vt okay so that's the gate channel voltage minus the vt let's put it out let me take a step back so this is v gate channel sorry so i'm going to look at the gate channel voltage right and see if what it is. So right here at the source, the gate channel voltage is V gate source. Okay, as soon as that is higher than a VT, then the transistor is on here at this point. There's a channel right at this point. Okay, now here, it's V gate, drain, okay, is the voltage here. So V gate minus V drain. That's the voltage at this point, right? If the drain voltage is higher than a certain amount, Okay, I'm gonna lose my channel here. Initially, I have a channel. If the, if the source voltage, if the, sorry, if the drain voltage is the same as the source voltage, I have a very high potential here, just as high as the potential here. 
So I'll have a channel across from here to here from the source to the drain. But as the drain voltage gets higher and higher, basically this, this point in the channel gets closer and closer to the gate voltage. And at some point it gets close enough that it's less than that magical threshold voltage. So I no longer get a, um, a channel here at the drain. And in fact, as um, you inc keep increasing the drain, this region where you don't have the channel is creeping towards the source more and more. So instead of a channel, you end up getting the depletion region, right? So instead of you're doing the in reverse of inverting the channel, you're taking the inversion away. You're moving the inversion away as you go from the drain towards the source. And so this is called pinch off. It means you're pinching off the channel. You no longer have that inversion reason, region. You've pinched off the inversion region. You just have a depletion region. And so what happens there is that you, your current, now notice our current is a function of, for the sake of discussion, let's say your source voltage is constant. Your current is a function of the gate voltage. Okay. And the drain voltage. Let's say that for the sake of discussion, let's say that the, the source voltage is constant. So when you hit this pinch off region, as soon as you hit it, you the drain is no longer able to control the current. Right up until then, um, you've created a channel. It feels like you've made a resistor between the drain and the source. Meaning that, so if you created this resistor as the voltage across that resistor goes up and down, you get a change in the current. It's not quite a linear change, sort of this weird square law change known as VDS. Is this really kind of a VDS times VG minus VDS squared over two, but we still call it sort of linear mode. But anyway, the current is dependent on the drain voltage as well as the gate voltage. But as soon as you go past this pinch off point, you're only dependent, your current is only dependent on the gate voltage, okay? So anyway, that pinch off region is when you hit, and it, that pinch off region is dependent on the source voltage. The source isn't always at zero. It's really dependent on not just the gate voltage, but the gate source voltage, the relationship between V drain source and V gate source and a VT. So up until that point, okay, you can just use this full equations here, okay? Right up until a certain drain voltage, which is defined by this, you can use this beta VGT minus VDS over to VDS. And this is called the linear region. So the transistor is on and like it's called linear, it's very loosely linear. Um, it means that, you know, an ideal world, you would like the current to be linearly dependent on the drain source voltage, but so you call it linear, but it's not really linear. It's this funky sort of square law type of thing still. Okay, so once you get past this point, once VGS is greater than VT, so that stayed the same, you've turned on the transistor, but once V drain source is greater than or equal to VGS minus a VT, okay, then your basically VDS, you can just pretend like VDS stays at VGS minus a VT. And you can plug that into this equation. So if you plug in VDS is equal to VGS minus a VT, you basically come up with a situation where you just have VGT squared. 
So you're no longer, you're only dependent on the gate voltage. You're no longer dependent on the drain uh, voltage as far as your current is concerned. And this one is called saturation. It's a region called saturation. Okay, so now let me draw, hopefully this is gonna make a little, well, I don't know if it makes sense or not, but let's draw with V drain source I sub D for various VGSs. Okay, so say in a case where VGS is, is below VT, okay, regardless of what the VGS is, you have zero current. So in this case, you'll just get no current with VDS. There's just no current in the device. The device is just off. So this is all cut off. And in this first order model, let's say, let's say, say VT is 700 millivolts. Uh, let's call it 500 millivolts, what the heck. Okay, if it doesn't matter in this, again, first order model, if the gate voltage is 100 millivolts, if it's 150 millivolts, 200 millivolts, 300 millivolts, 350, whatever it is, they all, there you get zero current across the device. So all those curves, so these are different, different VGSs I'm gonna draw on this thing. Um, you basically get no current, okay? At some point, at some point, VGS is gonna be a little bit over um, the threshold voltage, so we're gonna turn on. So what happens then is you're gonna start getting a current. Initially, when, say, when the, let me do, whoops. Let me do this, um, call this one volt. Uh, no, let's, let's call this three volts. Yeah. Now, let's say your, I'm gonna draw the orange when VGS is um, 600 millivolts, okay? Now the transistor is on, so I'm gonna start getting a current. And it's gonna depend on the drain source voltage in this funky way, it won't be it won't be a line. It'll be kind of a line with a curve on it, and then look like that until um, until VDS is six hundred millivolts minus five hundred millivolts. Okay, this is v, VGS minus a VT. So it's gonna go up, and at that point, it's gonna, so it'll be like that here. It'll be linear for just that little bit. Okay, then it's gonna flatten out. It's gonna go into this pinch off. And here, because it's just dependent on this gate source voltage, which in this case is 100 millivolts, this is gonna be a flat line. Okay, now let's say I'm gonna draw, um, I used pink before, Ooh, let's go, I'm gonna draw um, VGS is equal to um, one volt. Okay, now um, we have a, that that curve of ID will go up to when up to here. Here, VDS is one volt minus 500 millivolts. 
500 millivolt stays the same because your threshold voltage stays the same. So you have this current that goes up in this quote unquote linear way up to here. Okay, then it flattens out. And then I can keep going with different higher VGSs. You sort of get to higher values in this point where the crossover point between linear and saturation keeps shifting as a function of higher and higher gate source voltage. Okay, so this is the curve you'll see of a relationship of I sub D and VDS of a transistor, of a MOS transistor, okay? And this is an NMOS transistor. So let's look at a few, a few different things, okay? One is that it, it's not just a gate we always talk about. We always talk about, almost always, we're talking about the gate source voltage minus threshold voltage okay so if we just so that's this guy here so this is gate source voltage minus the threshold that's how we define vg2 so notice for that we have a score law dependence um, of of drain current versus the gate current this means once you turn on Okay, so once you're, this is the direction things are, currents are gonna go in saturation with V sub G. You're gonna get big steps between, this is one gate voltage, this is another gate voltage. The, when you subtract out the VT, you get a square law dependence on that. So your current goes up very quickly with, gate, with the gate voltage once you get higher than the threshold voltage. Okay, especially this this and in this region here, once you get past this point. Okay. And the other factor is that these NMOS, these crossover points between linear and saturation, they keep moving up to higher and higher drain source voltages as your gate gate voltage goes up. Okay. So that's the, the NMOS current versus voltage curve. Ah, and I think we're out of time. So let me, let me say just one more thing. The PMOS looks the same, except it's inverted. So if I was gonna drive, draw a PMOS, the curves would kind of look like this. If I draw it with the same sort of, um, uh, polarities as I drew the NMOS. So this would be a PMOS curve because now the gate has to be lower than the source by a certain amount and the drain has to be lower than the source by a certain amount in terms of absolute voltage. And the other thing is that the mobility for NMOS is about two to three times typically higher than the mobility for a PMOS. So meaning that you're for the same size device, for the same voltages applied or the same magnitude, absolute number for the voltages, you're gonna get a factor of two or three less current for a PMOS transistor as an NMOS transistor. Um, okay, guys, I'm going to stop here and hopefully that somehow between this lecture and the previous lecture, it's like now you have kind of an idea of why we have these three regions for the drain current as a function of the different voltages applied to the device and, you know, what the overall current versus voltage behavior of an NMOS looks like and what, you know, by, by analogy, what a PMOS looks like, okay? So, and then next lecture, we're gonna talk about 
the second order effects. So this is called a level one model. Like, so if you use a level one model in SPICE, this is what it's modeling. And as you use higher order models in SPICE, it's getting more sophisticated models and you start getting second and third order effects. Um, any questions? No, no questions. No. Okay. All right, guys, stay safe. Talk to you guys on Thursday. Thank you, Thank professor. you professor. Have a good one. Thanks, bye. Thank you.